Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. The script for this video has been ongoing for a number of weeks if not months, and it came about after my video on the Giza Plateau in the Sate period. After looking at the beautiful basalt sarcophagi of the Queen and Prince in the reign of King Amasis II of the 26th dynasty. These constructions are truly amazing works of stone, perfectly carved out of hard solid igneous rock. They are not merely limestone creations, but delicate working of incredibly hard stone. The Sate period was a revival in ancient Egypt, and as well as restoring age old cultural traditions, they also seem to have remastered the art of stonemasonry. Just look at the quality of these sarcophagi. How did they do it? More to the point, how did the pre and early dynastic Egyptians hollow out vases from solid lumps of diorite and cyanite? How did the dynastic Egyptians cut huge granite obelisks and intricate statues? And how did the Egyptians from the Sate period cut, shape and polish their amazing stone creations? A recent video series from the brilliant Uncharted X channel looked in depth at the perfect drill holes in solid granite, and Ben, the owner of the channel, pretty much proved that this wasn't the work of copper and bronze tools, sand and water, as various theories propose. These holes drilled into the stone, much like the diorite and cyanite vases of Egypt are unexplained, but with everything, I'm sure there must be a logical explanation. Before I go any further, I must say that the work on the Giza power plant hypothesis by Christopher Dunn is outstanding. But one thing I always think is that if it is true, then what did the Great Pyramid actually power? At present I'm not sold on the idea of ancient mechanical machines used to cut stone because, as far as I'm aware, nothing has ever been found to suggest this is the case. You could counter this and say the powers that be are hiding the evidence from the masses, but if you read the extensive works of the 19th century antiquarians, they make no mention of any kind of unknown technology. And yes, many will say that maybe the metal machinery has corroded and disintegrated naturally due to their age, but we do find many Old Kingdom metal tools and other metallic objects in the archaeological record. Earlier this year, I spent more than two months reading the work of Howard Weiss, Giovanni Belzoni, August Mariette, Aladrizi and Henry Salt, from field notes to final publications, and I must say they were quite meticulous in what they recorded. Unusual, strange and unexplainable finds were recorded. They didn't seem to have any agenda as far as I can see, because during the 19th century, Egyptology was an emerging field of study. There was no agenda back then, because not a lot was actually known. It really was a period of discovery. They had no rigid timelines or preconceptions, and they simply recorded what they found. From a strange glass-like bottle tinged with iron, to a strange dark layer found in one of the relieving chambers of the Great Pyramid, discoveries at Giza that had no explanation were recorded. And there was also extensive writing about a possible doorway on the back of the Sphinx. All of their writings can be read on the internet in their original form, yet no advanced technological finds were reported. There were no drill bits or electric saws, no bits of wire, but that doesn't mean I think that copper and bronze chisels, sand and water, combined with sheer brute force, is how the Egyptians created these amazing works of stone. Tools would have to be tipped with something harder than quartz, which would have to be topaz, corundum, also known as ruby and sapphire, or diamond. These precious minerals would need to be in crystalline form, but the quantity required for all of the stonework we see in ancient Egypt means the idea is very unlikely, and they also don't explain the amazing mirror-like finish we see on many objects that are made from hard igneous rock. If there was an ancient mechanical technology, we need to find proof, and the lack of finds probably means that this is not the type of technology we should be looking for. In my opinion, based on the current state of knowledge, ancient high technology isn't nuts and bolts, power cables and pylons, but it's more about harnessing nature, which I'll explain shortly. Of course there is a huge part of me that wants to believe in ancient high tech machinery. In the past, in the very early days of this channel, I created a handful of videos on different hypotheses put forward by researchers for how the ancients cut stone. 
One was that they harnessed heat from the sun, another the power of vibrational sound energy, and another looked at geopolymer concrete. Maybe some of these techniques were used to an extent, but not on the scale needed for the huge volume of precision stonework that we see in ancient Egypt. There must be something else we're missing. There must be a simple and logical explanation. By all accounts, the Saint period sarcophagi were not reused as some suggest. The finer details of these stone boxes are certainly of a style not seen before them, and they must have been created in the 6th century BC. I tackled the subject of the pre-Inca Peruvian stone walls in a video a few months ago, and yes, many people disagreed. But I still have faith in the concept proposed by Helmut Trebuch that the ancient Peruvians applied acid, which he says was used to soften stone. It's a simple and logical solution, and chemically and theoretically, it works. If you have a specific type of acid at the right concentration, it can dissolve or polish stone. And although I'll get many comments on this video telling me to do a demonstration and show how it's done, the fact is I'm not a stonemason and not a chemist. But I am a geologist and amateur historian, and I can read and understand a scientific paper. If the theory is correct, then the impeccable stonework we see in ancient Egypt and ancient Peru doesn't need to be the work of some lost ancient civilization with some lost ancient high technology machinery. If the technology to create the magnificent work was available naturally and in great abundance. Acid explains how stone could be moulded. It explains how you can give stone a fine-grained vitreous and polished outer surface that differs from the bulk of the rock. It explains why some rocks from ancient civilizations look just like they have been melted, and how they could have done such detailed work on such hard stone. It's strange how things sometimes synchronize, and when these thoughts were going through my head three months ago, an article was published on the website ancientorigins.net, written by Leah Mangalini. The fantastic article linked below in the description is certainly worth reading, and in this video I won't be going into the detail that Mangalini has, so I would urge you to read it after watching. But I will give you a brief overview of her work, and how she believes that ancient civilizations manipulated stone. To be clear, I'm not saying this is exactly how it was done, it's just one logical idea, because it would also explain why we find nothing in the archaeological record. I think harnessing nature to manipulate stone is a far better hypothesis than ancient power tools. It explains why a number of civilizations, disconnected by both space and time, could perform these seemingly stone miracles, from Pumapunku and Sacsayhaman to Egypt and beyond. This technology is a chemical reaction, information that could have been passed down orally from generation to generation and could have also travelled around the world. And this would be far easier than transporting machinery and all of the infrastructure that would be needed to make them work. The famous Norma palette looks almost like an imprint than a carved stone. The drill holes in the Egyptian granite show evidence of just a small number of revolutions for tools to gouge out perfect holes, whilst keeping the core intact. Because we're not talking about dissolving the stone away, although certain types of acid can do this. We're talking about softening the stone, or parts of the stone in a controlled manner. So, the ancient high technology for working stone could simply be a mixture of physical force and a knowledge of chemistry. A knowledge that certain chemicals can break down materials due to them being incompatible. The whole process would be extremely precise. The reactions would have to start and stop at a specific time, whilst ensuring that other stonework, tools and the person doing the work are all protected from such a volatile substance. According to Leah Mangalini's article, the acid used doesn't change the structure of the stone either. It liquefies it, making it easy to work and allows a fine finish. Granite with the acid applied is still granite after the work is done, but the application of this acid will do the hard work. And the action of using acid is entirely within reach of the ancient people. Today, many stones are finished with an acid wash to show off their beauty without manual cutting or polishing. The work is done at an atomic level, not with friction. And no, I'm not saying that the Egyptians understood atoms and particles, just that they could possibly understand that by adding a chemical to a rock, the rock can be easily manipulated. 
as stated by Mangalini, with a specific type of acid, drop by drop you can engrave or pierce precious stone. Create an empty cavity for a vase and then smooth its sides, make a malleable surface for the relatively easy carving of statues, and make coffins out of huge granite blocks. She says that layer by layer, the acid would consume the inside of a stone and then smooth it. If you want to mark a stone in a specific way, you can simply add a film of wax, because wax doesn't react with the acid. Just simply scratch away the wax in the areas you want the stone to be marked and then pour on the acid. Furthermore, by penetrating natural bedrock fissures with acid, you could remove boulders more efficiently as well. If the technology was fully understood, it would certainly have been a huge help in ancient times. The reason I like the idea of acid, just as I discussed in my video on the pre-Inca stone walls, is that it's accessible, believable, and explains the precision stonework, as well as the lack of evidence for how they did it in the archaeological record. The acid in question does not attack gold, lead or wax, and is the only natural solvent for silicon. Some of you may already know what it's called, but for those that don't, it is known as hydrofluoric acid, with a chemical symbol of HF. As Mangalini says, it is one of the most aggressive, extremely reactive, caustic and poisonous chemicals known, and she believes that this was the secret tool of the ancients. She believes that hydrofluoric acid was the Shamir of the Jews, used to engrave the tables of the law and to cut stone at the Temple of Solomon. It was the Pitto of Peru, a substance that oral traditions say was used to construct the ancient megalithic walls that came from a plant described as a low creeping grass with red leaves. The tradition says it was capable of melting every stone, and apparently the explorer Percy Fawcett talks of an amphora that was stolen from an Inca tomb that broke and the liquid leaked out and dissolved the stone below, as well as dissolving some iron. There is a great deal of evidence that links the Shamir of the Jews to the Pitto of Peru, so click the link in the description to learn more. If we assume the substance is hydrofluoric acid, then the ancients are telling us they obtain the substance from a plant, and there are over 40 species of plants that contain the poisonous hydrofluoric acid, which they absorb from the soil and synthesize to protect themselves from herbivores in the form of a compound called fluoroacetic acid. According to the researcher, extracting hydrofluoric acid from fluoroacetic acid is apparently not very difficult. You simply boil the plant, distill the solution, and then concentrate it. Apparently, hydrofluoric acid dissolved in water is relatively manageable at room temperature. Mangalini identifies the source of HF in Africa as most likely the Dishapatellum plant, and in South America, the Palicorea both of which are somewhat ugly plants, with little economic value today, and therefore they escape our attention. But, in the past, if these plants were farmed and cultivated in vast numbers, it could have generated enough HF for the incredible stonework that we see in places like Egypt and Peru. How the ancient people could have acquired the knowledge of harnessing acid from specific plants to use it to cut, shape and incise stone is unknown, but it could have been an oral tradition that existed for millennia, but wasn't until the megalithic cultures assembled into kingdoms and empires that it was created on an industrial scale. Mangalini offers no demonstration, it is all through research and reading, and she invites people to provide proof and evidence that it can be done. But obviously, hydrofluoric acid is an incredibly dangerous substance, so please don't try this at home. So, this is just a hypothesis, and no, it's not mine, but it does seem like one of the better ones. It does seem like Mangalini could be onto something. The acid hypothesized by Helmut Trebouche in his fascinating paper was a byproduct of mining, whilst that of Mangalini comes from plants. Both incredible ideas, and both seemingly plausible. But, of course, not without their problems. I don't think any such process of melting and moulding stone is as easy as the article makes out, and it would require huge amounts of knowledge and skill to bring it to life on such a grand scale. In theory, hydrofluoric acid can dissolve the silicate minerals of granite, but it wasn't like acid was poured onto a rock and then it becomes like Play-Doh. It also dissolves and reacts with many types of metal, so if the surface of a rock did become malleable, what tools were used to work the rock? Possibly other types of rock with a different composition. I don't know. 
And also, how would you store it if it dissolves through granite, glass and metal? In the modern era, it is stored in a special type of plastic container. In the 18th century, chemists did store the acid in glass bottles, but they were coated with wax. So, there is a way. In recent history, and not ancient, hydrofluoric acid has been used to etch patterns into and clean glass and ceramics, to dissolve rock samples, and to extract chemicals or fossils from rocks. It is used to clean stainless steel, and to prepare silicon wafers in the electronic industry. But just a small splash of HF on the skin will cause you major damage, eating through tissue and bone. And the vapours are extremely poisonous, and so it should only be used by trained experts in specially prepared labs. No, I don't think the pre-Inca and ancient Egyptians had such labs, but if they did use HF, we have no idea if their processes of making it, storing it and applying it, or the human cost in working with it. So, this isn't my hypothesis, but one that I read about, and one that I thought you'd like to hear. If the science does add up, it's certainly a fascinating prospect. I'm not a chemist, I know next to nothing about hydrofluoric acid, but it's given me something else to think about when researching the ancient world. I do like the idea that ancient civilizations used a stone softening agent, but was this substance hydrofluoric acid? Please comment your thoughts below. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.